Hello, my name is Sharon Rojo, and I'm one of the clinical education specialists here at Healthmark Industries. This presentation is called Inspection and Integrity Testing of Insulated Instrumentation. The learning objectives is we're going to discuss the failure rates identified from a 2019 case study of insulated instruments and devices. We're going to review the ANSI Amy SD79 2020 amendment that supports insulation testing of insulated instrumentation and devices. Identify the different types of damage of insulation and the root causes while identifying methods to actually protect those items and devices through the whole process. We're going to discuss best practices in building and maintaining an effective verification testing program within your department. Now, in the description of this presentation, there's been a lot of document cases that have risen in the past years under the FDA mod report, which is the Manufacturer and User Facility Device Experience Reporting System, where patients have had serious injuries and even device-associated deaths due to damage of integrity of insulation of electrosurgical instrumentation and devices. And this has solidified the importance of inspection and insulation testing for this type of instrumentation and devices more than ever. The lack of focus for inspection and insulation testing has misled our profession to forget, forget basically the diversity of electrosurgical devices, from bipolar forceps to even cables and cords, and the different types of sensitivity of insulation testers themselves and their accessories to cover, coverage the wide variety of instrumentation in our inventory. There is a wide variety of those insulated items, as you can see in this slide, depending on what you have, will depend on what type of tester and accessories that you would need to purchase. This ranges from laparoscopic, which is the majority of your, possibly your cases, but even bipolar forceps that are insulated can be used quite a bit. This is damage for the instrumentation shown on the previous slide, where you can see that some of this stuff can be so small that it can't even be really seen with the naked eye or even with magnification. You would need something more enhanced, as well as using an insulation te a tester in conjunction with that. Let's go over and review some of the FDA mod reports that were in this reporting system. In July 26 of last year, a handle, it was actually insulated handle, it was reported that the handle produced arcing resulting in blisters to the patient's skin. In April of 2021, a probe, the insert melted and arced from the side, burning an unintended portion of the liver. In September of 2020, a monopolar cord, four additional complaints were recorded for similar occurrences. A fire started while the surgeon was using a hook attached to the monopolar cord. The cord frayed near the plastic end, came off, and then fell into the pocket of the drape and started the fire. In March of 2020, in Anson Bipolar Forcep, the surgeon was cauterizing a vessel underneath the patient's tongue. The forcep arced and burnt the patient's lip. November of 2019, a monopolar hook Electric arc occurred near the wall of the small intestine. The surgeon inspected the hook and the coating was damaged. The patient had peritonitis with a loss of fluid in the peritoneum and a hole in the colon. This is a sequence of videos to show this is targeted tissue where they're cauterizing inside the sterile cavity of a, of a patient. But you can see on the far right, that's actually arcing and damage the insulation. This is another damage to um, an organ, and this one here that's looping is actually damage to the liver. Typically, you don't pan out when you're doing these type of procedures, but when you do, you could find there could be damage in the insulation more towards the medial or proximal end of that device. Objective one, we're gonna discuss the fail, uh, failure rates identified from the 2019 case study of insulated instruments. This case study was published in January, February of 2022 in the HSPA Process Magazine. It was a randomized experiment conducted in 2019. It was an eight month study. An example, sterile patient ready laparoscopic trays, non-sterile insulated forceps and non-sterile cables and cords were used in this specific study. It consisted of four states and seven facilities and the purpose of the study was to determine whether the type of insulation tester being used and the accessories can detect 
the insulation failures, basically looking at the sensitivity of the unit. In this picture here, you'll find that this tray was organized quite well. It was in one single tray, and this was open in, <clears throat> that was actually opened in the department, and it was a sterile tray ready to be used. But as you can see where it's circled is that the towel clips are actually scratching against the insulation itself which was causing damages and scratches and lesions on the side. So this tray, even though it looks great set up, was probably not the appropriate tray to be used with insulated items and they would need to be separated. So let's go into the results. So backup non-sterile insulated laparoscopic instrumenta uh, instrumentation, the failure rates were at 7%, meaning this was your backup stock that was either hanging or in drawers. And this was very high because your backup is not supposed to be damaged and it's not supposed to be um, dirty as well, but 7% were damaged. Insulated sterile and non-sterile cables and cords, the failure rate was at 11%. Insulated sterile and non-sterile laparoscopic trays, the failure rate was almost at a 20%, it was at 18. And this is at facilities that were testing. Insulated sterile and non-sterile forceps had the highest integrity failures, and this was at a 50% fail rate. As you can see in these pictures, these are just examples of what could have been found. So as you can see in the picture on the left, that it's being tested, and you can see it arcing already toward that distal end. The pictures on the right, you'll find that there's a lesion close to that distal end. When testing this device, you could think that it's just the metal going off. But in all reality, if you would go slow, you would look as you're doing that testing, you'll find that it would actually fail. And in closer observation with enhanced magnification, you would find a lesion. Also, the proximal end, which is typically the weakest point of a, a insulated bipolar forcep, is the base. And you can see there's a split that happens two ways around that tin, which is one side of that forcep, where that could actually arc and that could uh, cause an OR fire. Um, as well as burning the surgeon or the scrub tech. To continue with those results, one facility had a 75% fail rate for a laparoscopic tray, just within one tray, and they were testing. Another one had 50%, and you can see even the facility, one facility had 33% fail rate for just the cables and cords, and then almost 70% in a laparoscopic tray. Other facilities ranged from 22 to even almost 30% fail rate, and they were all testing. Again, to continue with this, in the experiment, a control tester was used, basically an insulation tester that was more sensitive. And whatever the facility had, in this case, they were using a insulation tester that was less sensitive, um, it actually failed. So in this specific facility, when the uh, control was used, the control found two to five breaks in the insulation, but the insulation tester used at the facility only caught one. That's really a 3.8 difference between the two. And let me tell you that even one, 1% uh, 1 of that would be enough to cause patient harm. We'll keep talking. So with this unit the here, video, the brand new battery was uh, replaced, this is supposed to be going and off. with the metal exposed already, this unit should be going off, and my finger is completely on the button, and, it still and it's still working. not going off, so there is something wrong with this unit. Place on that button, um, right in the center, you got to be okay. flat against um, the button going down, and you can see it wasn't working. So we don't even know how long that had been going on. I've been in other cases where the battery had enough juice to put the lights on, but it wasn't enough to actually test. The results showed numerous con uh, contributing factors to damage. What it showed that using inadequate insulation testing equipment, meaning equipment that maybe was cumbersome to use, it was just complicated. Um, it wasn't sensitive enough, meaning it had like a nine volt battery. Um, using inadequate accessories, for an example, the picture on the right, even though this specific insulation tester is fine, the problem is it only tests laparoscopic. So if your facility is doing just laparoscopic insulated devices and those procedures to use them, then this is fine, but if you're using cables and cords, if you're using uh, bipolar forceps, this will not be able to test that.
performing tests inadequately, meaning they were doing it incorrectly, the staff. Um, they weren't allowed enough time. It was a lot of maybe not enough inventory for the trays. So they were rushing. They didn't have education or forgot the education that were, they were provided five or even eight years ago in some cases where they were given an initial in-service, but there was no ongoing or annual education being performed as a reminder. There was not enough insulation testers in the department. So typically what I would find is one insulation tester to maybe six to even eight workstations. So if one tech was using it, and another tech needed it, they may not wait. Now, it would be nice to wait, but a lot of times we don't have that luxury and we have a turnover that we're trying to accomplish. So having those testers at every workstation, just like you have integrators at every workstation, you, maybe you have a scanner gun or whatever it may be, the price should not overrule the quality or the compliance of testing. Incorrect care at point of use where maybe the surgical team is not taking care of the instruments during the procedure, where maybe the surgeon's a little rough on the instruments, maybe the instrument is dropped. And then even that post care, um, incorrectly arranging those instruments because they're delicate and separating them from the metal ones. Incorrectly packaging those insulated items individually, meaning maybe they're peel pouched and maybe they're not being protected. And we're not just talking about the tip, we're talking about the shaft. Also, as you saw in a picture in a previous slide, the tray is maybe not the correct tray and maybe it needs to be separated with a, a separate rack. Incorrect storing or failing to uh, monitor stored backup, like we talked about the backup had a high 7% fail rate, and maintaining that backup or the storage where it's kept. As you can see here in those, um, these pictures on the top right, that was actually bad staging in Deacon Town, where the cord was just thrown with other metal instruments and it got caught in the wheat liner here. The tray on the bottom was a sterile tray that was open, but even though the cable and the lenses, I mean, there's a lot of things wrong with this tray, um, maybe it looks organized and it's all a one-stop shop for the surgical team. You can see that the male scissor, or the suture scissor in the middle is scraping against that cable and there was breaks found in that specific cord. Objective two, we're gonna review the ANSI ST79 2020 amendment. Testing. 8.2.1, it's a new section in the document and it's called inspection of instruments intended to be used with electric current. Now, in this statement, it says instruments should be organized and protected from damage like we noted before in this similar picture. But looking at different types of trays to meet the need of separating those delicate insulated items. Instrumentation intended for use with electric current should be tested for integrity each time it is processed. So this is great because now we have something that's in writing saying that it needs to be tested every time it comes through the department, uh, department to be processed. Not weekly, not monthly, not when your repair service comes every three months. It's great that they can look at the tray, but the testing itself needs to be done every time the tray comes down, or comes through the department. It goes on to say that each installation tester may be supplied with a variety of accessories to test specific instrumentation and cables and cords based on their design. Cables and cords are also a source of concern and need to be inspected and checked for two things, integrity and continuity. Integrity means the outside of the core. As you can see, this specific adapter can test that. The picture on the far left is a cable continuity tester, which would test the inside of the cord because a cord can look fine and pass the integrity piece of it, but it doesn't mean that the inside of the cord was detached inside or broken where you would never know that. And these are prime examples that when these cords get damaged could cause an OR fire. The document in this section goes on to say that the insulation should be checked at appropriate inspection points and offers a table, table one, and actually pictures or figures one through five. So what's really nice is that in this table, in this specific section, it'll go over the instrument device to be inspected, inspect in, uh, inspection points, possible damage, and then methods to assist with inspecting slash testing, which you have nice pictures that are in color to help you understand what is being asked to look at. 
in that same table, for an example, it will say laparoscopic including robotic. And then on the far right, methods to assist with inspection and testing. In one of those bullet points, it does talk about enhanced magnification microscope. And you can see there's a picture here taken with that um, that's very, it's close up. It can range between 10 to 240 times the magnification. So you can really see the damage. Now, what's really important about using enhanced inspection to look at that at the damage after you've tested those devices is, well, why would you need to do that? Well, you also need to look at root cause. You can't just find damage, replace it with another instrument that's good, and then move on. You need to look at root cause to determine, wow, it's the same type of damage, it's the same type of scrape, to determine, oh my gosh, it's the container. And maybe you were blaming the OR, and maybe OR is blaming SPD, and to find out, it's actually a third party in an easy fix. It could just be the way it's being arranged. In the table on the very bottom of this, um, in, towards the bottom middle, it talks about insulated forceps. So it does call out that bipolar forceps are another insulated item that needs to be inspected and tested. Objective three, discuss best practices in building and maintaining an effective verification testing program. So really the way you want to start off this program is having the correct accessories and having the correct tester or a more sensitive tester. Correct accessories and the tester is based on your inventory. Whatever you have in inventory that are insulated items, that's how you go and you shop around to make sure those accessories are one, they can fit you or test those insulated devices and two, that they're easy to use. You also want to make sure that there's no damage to the accessories. So let's say you've had your tester for a few years. You need to make sure that you have the education initially and annually to determine what is damage to your accessory like you see here on the bottom left. The brush here is kind of flattened and kind of sprayed out. And that's not really going to be testing for you effectively. So you need to re actually replace that. The picture right next to it, you can see that this specific accessory has a really big hole. And then the one on the right is actually a newer one. So making sure that you look at the normal wear and tear of these devices and that you're able to identify those. The picture on the bottom of that is a grounding cable that has been repaired with tape. So this is a danger to you, a staff member, when you're testing, and this can also cause a fire because you have exposed wire and you should not be re uh, replacing that insulation with sterile tape, steam tape, or any type of tape, and you need to throw that cable away and replace it with a new one. And of course, the pictures on the right are just examples of specific accessories for specific insulated items. So to continue with that, Having enough insulation testers like we talked about earlier per workstation if you want that compliance. You have to have effective initial and annual, edu annual education, meaning not just an in-service. You really need to know the anatomy of the insulation tester. You need to know what is a, a damaged accessory and if it is damaged, can it be fixed or do you have to replace it with a new one? Looking at a more sensitive insulation tester as well, and insulation testers are a lot like cars. You can range from a Toyota all the way to a Tesla, and that would also include the price. But remember, you can't put a price on quality. Be familiar with the new ANSI AME ST79 Amendment 2 in the document. And you also wanna make sure that you collaborate uh, with and educate your surgical and your infection prevention professionals to be able to help you collaborate on a better um, effective insulation testing program. You also want to make sure that you're doing for leadership in general is interview and do periodic audits with your repair service. This would also include the frontline team when you feel like something's wrong or maybe something looks a little different with your insulated items. Make sure that you're asking the repair service, you know, what are they looking for for damage and what is the frequency and if they're looking at a laparoscopic trait or set of yours, what instruments are they actually inspecting? Because many times I've been in facilities where they're just looking at the metal instrumentation on the bottom and it was never written in the contract to actually look at the insulated items. The contract could have been eight or even 10 years ago drawn up. So no one even knows that they weren't even looking at those insulated items. The picture on the right is a prime example of the insulation pulling back 
which is not good, where this is an area where BioBurden can get underneath and actually shave off a little bit on the insulation and fall into the sterile cavity of the patient. So this is a combination between um, the frontline teams not being educated to know that it needs to be flushed against that distal tip and the repair service wasn't even looking at the instrumentation because it was this specific instrumentation because it was a part of the contract. Objective four, we're gonna identify the different types of damage to insulation and the root causes. So we need to look at your tray setup and your decontent staging bad practices. So we so showed this picture on the bottom left where maybe you need to separate the cord or cable or cord into a peel pouch or maybe go disposable. The picture in the middle is an example of bad staging and decontent. So I can understand why the metal instruments are on top of the insulated item, probably because to hold them down, because maybe there's a strong impingement in their washer and it kind of bounces them back up and they get stuck in the blades. But maybe separating them, maybe put the insulated items in the rack themselves that they came in in the tray to separate them, but keep them secure. The picture on the right would be you know, going to a different tray system, you can see here the metal instruments are scraping against that insulated item. Now, just because an insulated item passes the insulation testing, it doesn't mean it's actually good to go. You still need to look at scratches, gouges, lacerations, and such that maybe can pass insulation testing. It didn't go all the way through to expose the metal, but it's still areas a bio burden to settle. So you also need to look at your backup, and these are definitely some bad practices. So the picture on the left is backup for insulated bipolar forceps. As you can see, there's two things going on here. Number one, you have metal mixed in with your insulated items, and you just have too much going on here. So after evaluating and testing each one of these forceps that were insulated, it was around 80% fail rate. And this was just the backup. This is supposed to be backup ready to go and use in your tray. So look at separating your insulated items in its own container and maybe not stacking them really um, high and bunch them up because they would definitely get damaged. The picture on the right is a, an example of laparoscopic insulated items. It's a combination of laparoscopic instrumentation where it's just too much. It's too much and also it's exposed. So you could have dust settling on these instruments. And if I needed one in the back or in the middle, I have to take all the other ones off, which are now scraping against the other ones there. So it's always good to go back and reevaluate at least annually all your backup to say, you know what, this surgeon left two years ago. I don't really think we need this instrument that we have 30 of. Maybe we can trade that into the vendor to get maybe two of the ones that we need all the time. So something to think about. Repair bins. So repair bins are just that. They're bins for instruments to go out for repair. But the instrument in this case could just have one damage. But because they're all put into one bucket and they're really, you can see it's like pickup sticks in a way, um, you're now causing other damage. So making sure that when you have your repair bins of any kind, whether it's for power equipment, um, eye instrumentation, making sure that you don't have one bin. Maybe you have a handful of bins where each one has its home so it doesn't get more damage for the damage that was caught um, initially. So let's talk about post-operative staging back practices. So this is when maybe the OR is maybe in a hurry, or maybe there hasn't been adequate ed education on how to properly separate and pre-treat those instrumentation. Now in this picture, yes, there's a lot going on, the bad practices with the camera, the lenses, the rigid endoscopes, excuse me, but also um, really the focus here is about the insulated items on the very bottom and making sure that we're separating those from anything that's metal. Now, this is a combination between education and insufficient repair service. So let me explain. The picture on the top left is you can see that it's pulled back, which is not good, and it's kind of worn down. This was a combination between the staff and SPD not being educated to know that it needs to be flushed against the unit and it was actually a bad repair job where the instrument was repaired, but it wasn't repaired correctly. The picture in the middle on the top was just 
over time, wearing back. It had a little piece of insulation missing, which is not good because that could have hopefully not fall uh, fell into the patient. The picture on the top right is a an L hook, where you can see there's a gouge, big, pretty deep gouge there, laceration, um, where the instrument was tested, and because they went so fast, they just assumed the metal tip was just going off. When all reality, it was also close to that distal end. And you can see that the insulation is frayed and coming off. The picture on the bottom left is a separation, which is a another bad repair service where it was detaching from the handle. So now we're talking about the proximal end. The picture on the bottom middle is actually an insulated bipolar forcep where this would be considered like a pinhole so you really couldn't see this with the naked eye but it did go off on the insulation tester and then to find out when you use enhanced inspection you can see the metal exposed the picture on the bottom right is you can see that mineral deposits actually built up around that edge where the insulation was pulling back. And this was um, a combination between the repair service not checking the instruments because it wasn't part of the contract and the SPD staff did not know that the, ha the insulation needed to be flushed against that distal tip. So this is damage from metal brushes, cleaning brushes, and a bovi pad being used on the specific um, cauterizing instrumentation. So the picture on the far left is a metal brush, and you can see what it does. You know, it's so easy to, to use the metal brush because it takes all the bio burden off that metal tip, um, but it also takes and frays the insulation where those pieces can fall into the patient in their sterile cavity. And then they would come back about six or seven days later with abdominal pain and then to do an exploratory lap to find those pieces in the body. The picture in the middle is a prime example of two things. One is a cleaning uh, metal, metal brush and a bovey pad. So again, do not use any type of bovey pad or metal cleaning brush. In the far right, you can see this was really, really excessively bad. Insulation handles. So if your handles are insulated, it may not be your whole tray. It may just be a few instruments in that tray, or it could be an individual item. So in this case, you can see where it's split on the far left. In the middle picture here, the whole side actually came off after it was uh, put pressure on to actually test it. And then the picture on the far right, which is typical where these type of handles get damaged quite frequently because it sticks out and you can see where the metal is exposed. This is really um, bad for, as we talked about the FDA mod report, where a patient got blisters. So more likely the incident was taken out of the port it was laid maybe on the drape and then it burned through the drape and then caused the blisters. But this can also uh, burn right through the surgeon's glove. And there's been documented cases where it's done that as well as the scrub tech. So it's essential to make sure that you're looking at your examples and testing them. These are examples of bipolar forceps. Again, the weakest part of a bipolar forcep, if the base is plastic and the tins are metal then and typically they are metal then this is the base is where it's going to crack so you can see two different left and right type of cracks where it can happen on top or it can happen all the way down that base the middle picture is somewhere in the shaft where there was a break and this would cause like the one incident where the fda mod report where the surgeon was burning a vessel underneath the tongue and then ended up burning the patient's lip on the bottom this would be a prime example of probably what that would look look like. Thank you for listening to this presentation.